Oh Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall declare your praise. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Colossians 1. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the words of God fully known. The mystery, hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. If there is a passage in scripture that um, typifies how one is reconnected to God, I think Paul nails it here. Um, he is enduring affliction because that is what happens to the people of Christ. And he's doing it for the sake of the gospel of Christ. And um, I, I really wrestled with preaching on that text today because I like it so much, but that's not why you choose a text. So, <laughs> I preached on Mary and Martha for the benefit of the brethren. Um, let us pray. O oh Lord, grant us the Spirit to hear your word and know the one thing needful, that by your word and Spirit we may live according to your will, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God, the Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit bless and preserve you. Amen. Okay, um, we are in 1 John 5, verse 1. 1 John chapter 5, verse 1. got some notes that I may need to refer to. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. Um, Peter's confession, Matthew, Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. So, uh, John 3.16, For God so loved the world, uh, that whosoever is engendered in him, that's literally what the Greek is saying, uh, who, who has been birthed by him, uh, by God, um, uh, believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Um, and, and various other passages like that tell us that this is all the work of God. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. For learning reasons, we sometimes parse that out. And it's important that we recognize that the Father did not 
become incarnate in the flesh for us. The Spirit did not become incarnate in the flesh for us. Only the Son became incarnate in the flesh. But the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all work together in both creation, redemption, and sanctification. Okay? Um, we talk oftentimes from catechism language, third article, the work of the Holy Spirit who calls me by the gospel. Yes, that's all true. But the Holy Spirit is the one who's engendering that. He's the one who's um, seeing to it that, that it takes place. But it's the Father's plan, the Son's work, the Holy Spirit's deliverance, if you will. And those things get all kind of jumbled and mixed up sometimes. But not to, the, not to God, only to us. Especially when we try to parse it. Everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. Uh, any reason why there should be conflict in congregations? <laughs> yes, because the old nature clings to us. Um, but here again, uh, I like the early church practice. Have any of you heard of the Holy Rood? It was a, a, a cross carved out usually with the figure of Christ on it. And um, this would be passed around to all the communicants before they came to the altar. And everyone would, would kiss this holy root to show that they were in perfect fellowship with the Father. And then they would turn to their neighbors and do the same thing. And if someone refused to do that, the whole service literally came to a halt until that was mended. Because there, there ought not ought not be any conflict between those who confess Christ. That is why we commune only at altars with people who say, say what we say about Christ. Okay? Mary. What does that mean, whoever has been born of him? Well, um, okay, let's go back to the the first verse. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. Okay? Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Okay? And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. So, all fellow Christians. Okay? Now, here is where it gets a little messy because of our old nature. Um, there are sometimes conflicts, not just between spouses who come to the communion table, okay, but fellow Christians who come to the communion table. And um, what I was suggesting is that in the early church, this practice didn't happen. It was dealt with before communion. Okay? Um, and that's, if, if one has been born of God, that is, believes in Jesus as the Christ, I cannot deny that he is my brother or sister. That's basically what that means. As you have opportunity, Paul says in Galatians 6, do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. That language there, household, it literally means this congregation. Because in the early church, where did people meet? In the house, in houses, the household of faith. Those who, and faith there, I would say, um, it, 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 it's not just talking about our connection to God, but it's talking also about the expression of that connection to God. So, for example, if we talk about faith in Christ, faith there is a verb. But if we talk about the faith, what are we talking about? The content of that faith, okay? The content. So, the faith, confess the faith, in the words of the Nicene Creed. Confess the faith, in the words of the Apostles' Creed, etc. So, confessing the faith is what 
those who have faith do together. And when we refuse to do that together, then, then we, as we shall see, uh, run up against God. Okay? By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey His commandments. Now that seems to be a kind of a subjective criteria, doesn't it? A subjective criteria. What are we talking about here? Obey his commandments. That could be a tough one. I would suggest we can think of it this way. Commandments are burdensome when they are our access to God. Say that again. Commandments are burdensome when they are our access to God. In other words, if I'm going to reach God through the law, either I have to do some shenanigans, don't I? Either I have to be pharisaical about my keeping of the law, or I have to be antinomian about what the law actually says. There's really no middle ground if I'm going to try to reach God that way. Um, I, I, I would, I'd like you to think of this perhaps in, in a little bit different way. The commandments are not burdensome, uh, he's going to tell us in a moment. They are burdensome when, when we endeavor to reach God that way. Because what does the law do? It convicts, shows us our sin. It always, what's the, what's the A word? Always accuses. Always accuses. I love my wife. Yes, I do. She's easy to love because she loves me. But loving someone who doesn't love me, that's a little bit different story. Huh? Except God doesn't give me that, does he? Yeah. Andy. The second verse... Uh it can imply, or one could read into it, that that we love God all the time and we always obey all the commandments, which is the legal <laughs> approach, mm -hmm. which we can't do. So it's almost as if it would be, and we obey, well, how about we, <coughs> not that this makes an, an out for it, you know, but in reality, I'm saying that we usually love God. <laughs> And yeah, on our terms, yeah. uh, I think I heard that in the sermon this morning. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and try to obey some of his commandments some of the time, or we do obey. And I, I especially want you to obey this particular commandment. Yeah. You know, you yeah. need to pay attention. Yeah, right. I'm okay with that one, but, but you got a problem. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and, and I think that's all true. But I, I would offer that when we when we truly understand that God is love, then the commandments do not become burdensome to us, but they become what Lutherans refer to as third use of the law, guide, direction. I would, uh, let me give you an example. Um, one of the things I ran into when I taught in Kenya uh, among both deaconesses deaconess students and pastoral students, was the reality that now that I'm baptized, I don't sin anymore. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And so, if I take something, I, I'm not sinning, I just took it because I needed it. Even though it had your name on it, or whatever. So, um, is that justification? Is that justification? Yeah. Yeah, that's how they justify their, their activities. Mm -hmm. And and see, there is there is some truth to that, isn't there? Mm -hmm. From God's perspective, if I have faith in his son, I am perfectly holy and innocent. Blameless. Blameless. 
an unburdened conscience, etc., etc. But the law, if I read the law correctly, doesn't allow that in my life. The law nails me when I try that <coughs> with the function of the law, because it always accuses. And that's the part that some of my, our students were missing in Kenya. So somewhere along the line, in one of the first classes I had, I would ask this question. So how many of you have committed murder today? I didn't get any hands raised. No volunteers. Well, I did. Uh, it was a guy on the freeway. Hopefully. <laughs> so then, so then I, I would push that a little bit and say, well, how does God define murder? And eventually some one who had studied a little bit would come up with the passage, he who hates his brother is a murderer. Okay? What is hate? Hate's the opposite of love. What does God ask of us? Love. So, if you have not loved, and, and by the way, in the Greek, this isn't an issue. Love is, a, is a, a verb that always needs an object. The only time it doesn't is when you're talking about God. God is love. Okay? Every other time, there's an object. Um, love always takes an object. I, I think that's called, is that transitive verbs? You, you school teachers? I've forgotten. It's been so long. Love of something. Okay. Now, hate is the opposite of love. We agree? Hate also is an infant. It doesn't need an object. Hate is describing an absence of something. So if you hate, you are not loving. So how many of you committed murder today? Then I got a few more hands. <laughs> Finally, I, I would say, now tell me, have you loved everyone in this room today? Just since breakfast? Or yeah. chapel time? In the liturgy, in confession of sins. <laughs> Eventually, you know, I, I, I keep the law on people until they said, mea culpa. Uh. And you see, that's exactly what the law does to us. And so we tend to think that God's law is bad because it makes us feel bad about our behaviors. And it should. That's its purpose. But it's not its only purpose. That's why I invite you to think of this as third use of the law. Now that I know whose I am and who I am, I will love the neighbor as myself. That's my endeavor. Endeavor, yes. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And then at the end of the day, when you're keeping track and taking stock, <laughs> blew it again. Yep. Yeah. And um, that, that's exactly uh, what I, I would offer to you John is getting at here. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey His commandments. Love one another as I have loved you. Loved you. <coughs> Are we successful in that? No. Do we stop trying because we can't be successful? Nope. No. That's the step outside faith. So, if we think of John, what John is saying in that realm, I, I think we will be in good shape. Uh, Pastor, we were just talking about how uh, you can rationalize hate and say, oh, I, I don't hate anybody. I just but, don't like them. Yeah, much. yeah, right, right. But your explanation, you hit it uh, in that the absence of love is, is, is there. There's no, there's no gray area. It, it, it's, it's, you know, you either love someone or you hate them. Yeah, thank you, Nord, for the great compliment, but it wasn't me. It was God who said that. Yes, well, okay. <laughs> well thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
That doesn't work really, not in America or in English, because there's no dictionary definition of hate saying absence of love. Yeah, yeah, and, and uh, that, that's why I say the Greek is so clear here. The Greek is. The Greek is very clear. And just by, by, by the way the two words are so used. the translation is bad. Well, the way we use terms in English maybe is bad. But that, that's why pastors are usually trained in the biblical languages, so they can understand what it is they're actually talking about. Um, if you're my age, uh, or you've been around, you've probably heard, love in tennis means no points scored and you have nothing. You know? That's really more of a definition of hate. Okay? It, it really is. Uh, but that's why I said, um, the key in understanding that is uh, hate it is a word that doesn't need an object. If you and I are in the room and I'm not loving you, Rick, then what, is, what am I doing? That's what God says. Then I am hating. And, and you're absolutely right. Uh, you know, I remember when I was a young teacher, well, I love everybody, it's just people I can't stand, you know, kind of stuff, you know. Um, you know, we say the, those silly kinds of things, but it's really true. We don't really love. We don't really love. And even in our best love, which I would say uh, the best we can speak about love is the familial love between husband and wife comes the closest to how we can understand that give and take of real love. Not just, boy, it was fun being with you. You bought your round of beer and I bought mine and we had a good time. Uh, you know, that's not love. Um, love is biblically defined as patient, long-suffering, kind, enduring, never ceasing. For us, it's an enormous gray area. <laughs> yeah, first Sue and then Barbara. I'm not Sue. Uh, sorry, first Helen and then Barbara. <laughs> That's okay. I thought you were going to fix him, Jan. <laughs> anyway, I had fifth grade Sister Mary Barbara. And it took me, she summed this up in pretty good words, but it took me almost into my adulthood, well, well into my adulthood, before I really understood what she was saying. But she always told us that it was a rocky road to heaven. That's what she told us. <laughs> and so I used to think, I'll never get to heaven. I'm never going to get to heaven, because I just can't do it. But and what she's really she said, saying, I can't do it. Wait. As soon as, as soon as that came to me, what she was really saying is, you're going to keep trying and trying and trying on this rock and you have it. But it took me a long time to figure that out. But she used to tell us that all the time, and I used to think, well, that's really stupid to tell us kids that. How are we ever going to get to but, but as soon as you say, I can't do it, then you come close to faith. See, now, now you have said, I can't. He now has. you have to let God do it. He has. Yeah. yeah. And, and um, believe me, that, that is a great eye-opener. A lot of people struggle with that all through life. And if you don't, there's something radically wrong with what you call faith. Because it is a struggle. It's a constant struggle. One day we think we're up here. The next day we've, we're down here. You know, and, and God's looking at it as, this is my baptized child. And we're struggling, you know, up and down the hill. H have any of you ever been to uh, Siena, Italy? I have been. Okay, it's a beautiful city, right? Yeah. <laughs> I was there with my wheelchair-bound daughter. And they were setting up for the annual horse race. Which, if you've ever known Siena, you know about that. And so they had it blocked off, and we couldn't get where the rest of the crowd, our, our family group, was. 
Her husband, I, and her son pushed her up a hill, I swear, was like that. Wow. And um, if it would have been any longer, I probably wouldn't be here today. Um, <laughs> that was work, I'm just saying. Uh, not to mention the fact that I'm kind of gimpy anyway trying to get up hills nowadays. And uh, uh, it was a very interesting thing. That's what it's like trying to make our relationship with God via the law. And just about the time we just about get to the top, the brakes yeah. give out and we slide all the way back down to the beginning. And I'm not so sure that's bad. I think God does that for our good. Barbara. By the grace of God, I am forgiven. Yeah. Every day. And, and that's times what we look at. And we, we don't cover up sin. We don't say, I am forgiven, therefore sin doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. um, well, one of the great blessings of having a school connected with the church is you get a lot of chance and opportunity to teach people about forgiveness. Both um, children who have not been baptized and their parents who don't know the difference. Okay, And uh, I remember many times uh, saying to parents, you know, at, at, at like parent-teacher meetings or something, when the question would come up, how do you forgive? You know? and, and I would say, well, we always forgive. Our forgiveness is never perfect. In this life, it's always subject to our old sinful nature. However, the most important thing is to say the words. Teach your children to say the words. I'm sorry, I forgive you. And then you model those words in your life in front of your children. And that will come a long way to them understanding what forgiveness is. And by the way, I've learned over the years, um, not only in my own life, but in the lives of parishioners and others, that there's something medicinal about saying the words. About saying the words. Uh, this morning, your pastor said to you, I forgive you all your sins. Do you know what it's like for somebody to come to the reality of that means their sins? That happened to me on New Year's Eve. Uh, we always had a service of corporate confession and individual absolution. And we had an altar arrangement, uh, much uh, not an altar, but a, a, a communion rail arrangement, much like Holy Cross, except in a bigger scale. We could do like 22 people on a side, you know, and we had two sides. So um, we could just about get everybody in for a New Year's Eve service at one time. And they'd come up and kneel, and um, we had done corporate confession. Then they would come up and receive individual absolution. And this man came up with his wife. <coughs> and I'll never forget this as long as I live. Uh, by the grace of God, I was able to catechize him after this. But when I got to him and I pronounced the absolution, so and so, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, he just started crying. And he couldn't stop. And that's the reality of forgiveness. And it's hard for us to believe that God would love us and do that for us. It really is difficult to believe. And that's where we live between our conscience. Um, how does Luther say that? Um, grace is God's love toward us. But peace is peace in our conscience because we know God's love toward us. Something like that. And, and I think it's profound. Uh, that's why pastors almost always begin their sermons, grace and peace to you from God our Father. That's the old agenda form. Now sometimes we say grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father. But that, that's saying God, God has done this for you, and that brings a quiet conscience, and it tames the old Adam. 
it just slaps him around. Uh, I'm talking to you. And, and that's important because, boy, those things can play on our, on our minds and hearts, can they not? Just, just really thumping on us uh, in our daily lives. And that's what happens when the law takes over. And Barbara, you're absolutely right. God's grace. It's all about God's grace. God's action. Arrow down. Okay. Um, okay, time for a little two-minute aside here. This is one of the reasons why I so much appreciate the worship culture at Holy Cross. Because it's focused not on arrow up, what I'm doing for God, but on what God is doing for me. That doesn't mean I sit there, you know, as Pablum and kind of think about what I'm doing next week. No, it's, wow, he's, he's telling me um, that God loves me. Uh, <laughs> one, of the, one of the things, again, from my Kenya experience that just amazed me was that some of my students had never heard that preached. <coughs> Christ died for you. That's one of the great things about English language, I found out uh, when I was in Kenya. You is both singular and plural in English. Christ died for you, y'all. <laughs> and Christ died for you, Steve. See, that, that, that individuality is a powerful proclamation. That's not true in every language, by the way, you know. And so you have to you have to work around those kind of things when you're saying Christ died for you. Well, he's talking to the person behind me. He's not talking to me. Uh, where in, in English the proclamation is a little cleaner. Okay. Anything else? Let's go on. And his commandments are not burdensome. <laughs> yeah, that's the hard part. And, and I would say they are not burdensome when they are directive. Third use of the law. First and second, absolutely. I, I would argue that the great um, cultural war in our country today is people arguing against the natural use of the law. <coughs> and and uh, I, I'm dumbfounded that people don't see that. And I guess it's because they have been disconnected long enough from uh, objective truth so that it doesn't have to be believed. Um, for the Christian to say his commandments are not burdensome, we have to go back to King David. Lord, I love your law and I meditate upon it day and night. That was a child of God. No unbeliever could ever say that. Because if you meditate on the law of God day and night, you're just going to find nothing but sin and death and crap in your life. And I'm being polite here. Okay. But his commandments are not burdensome. That's a great promise. Well, uh, some pastor once said to me, God gave the Ten Commandments out of love. And I went, what? What are you talking about? But if you think about it, you know, we'd be all willy-nilly without the guidance of the law. Um, I, I heard that from a kindergarten teacher in a school um, one day. <laughs> and I was passing around through the courtyard of the school doing my pastoral observation stuff. And I heard this kindergarten teacher say, well, children, does God give us his law because he loves us or he hates us? Hmm. You know, and I said, now that is a refreshing way to think about it. God isn't giving us this because he doesn't like us. He's giving us this because we need it. We need it. Just like a parent will have house rules. In this house, we don't talk to one another that way. 
We talk out like a this. I'm just familiar. I'm familiar with that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> sorry, I couldn't resist. Uh, that, that commandment was not burdensome. Um, so, uh, when, when we think about his commandments are not burdensome, that's only when we, when we look at them by faith in Christ. That Christ is the object of our salvation, not our keeping of the law. Then we say, ah, now I'm going to strive to live in God's will. I, uh, Master, I, I go back to the, the greatest commandment of all is to love the Lord and your God with all your heart and soul and all your mind. And if you if you focus in on that alone, not not all the Ten Commandments that itemize all of the sins that we commit, but just basically, can we even come close to keeping that law? No, no. I mean, that's the commandment of loving the Lord your God. And after that, all the other things fall into place if we if we say or see that our, you know, our obedience or our uh, our love is direct to God and all that he's, He has given us and, and that, so that you don't have to even go into this, did I murder someone today or anything like that? Did you love God above all, all, all things? And the answer is always no. 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 Yeah. Right. But... Turn that around the other way. Does God always love nor above all things? The answer is yes. And that's what we focus on. Right. That's what we might have to focus on. Then, oh, God loves me, therefore I may love nor too. And nor may love me, etc. etc. Yeah. yeah. And and that's that's the life of the Christian. An interesting life. Anything else? Dennis? What's the parallel between love and forgiveness? I mean, what's, we tend to separate those words out into individual ideas, but are they exactly the same? Are they what? Well, let's go back to the garden. Okay. Um, there is no sin then suddenly there is doubt, then there is active disobedience, recognized as sin. Uh, I, I knew that I was naked and I was ashamed and I hid myself. Um, so when we talk about the fall, there's usually consequences. One is the wrath of God. God is now an angry God. Punishing. No, angry. angry. At sin. Two, um, separation. And we see that immediately. The woman that you gave to be with me, Adam <laughs> throws Eve right under the bus. You know, and then he blames God for it, too. Yeah, exactly. sure. That you gave to be with me. Um, and, and then, the day you eat of it, you will die. So, all of those are the consequences of the lack of love. Forgiveness reestablishes connections that have been broken through sin. So, are they parallel? Yes. Are they the same? No. They both have the same object in mind. God's love now, I am to reflect that. I was created in his image. I have lost that. But now, partially, I have it restored again. Okay? Howard? I like to think of it as when we're born, we got a big stamp on our head that says, you're damaged goods. And that stays there until... God creates a new man in the resurrection, which he has promised for all those that believe in Christ. When does that resurrection take place? So be careful how you express that. It's not in the resurrection. It's in the first resurrection. 
as it's talked about in the book of Revelation. The first resurrection is we were dead in our trespasses and sins. He has made us alive in Christ. That's the first resurrection. Yeah. Okay. So, um, the second resurrection, and by the way, the book of Revelation talks about that. Um, therefore, the first death, this earthly death, has no power over us, nor does the second death. And what is the second death? Eternal separation from God. So, uh, there are resurrections and there are deaths talked about in the book of Revelation that help us understand that a little bit more. And after that, the new man comes forth. Yes. Yeah, except what happens to that new man. Like Luther says, um, uh, the old Adam is drowned and dies with all sin and evil lusts, and a new man daily comes forth and arises. And Luther was commenting on that one time, and he said, yeah, it is true that baptism drowns the old Adam, but he's a mighty good swimmer. <laughs> yeah. And, and I, I, I won't speak about your life, but when I look at mine, boy, do I see that parallel. You know, the good that I would, I don't do, and the evil that I don't want to do, I do. I do. That's me. Tyrone. How about on, on, on the Lord's Prayer when we talk about uh, our trespasses and that we ask God to also forgive us as well as others? Well, we ask God to forgive us even as we forgive those who trespass against us. Yeah, is that a conditional promise there? <laughs> kind of. Let's look at it a different way. Without love, you cannot love. Or forgive. Without forgiveness, you cannot forgive. So, um, because God forgives us, I can forgive you. Now, as a pastor, pastors sometimes have to go to parishioners who are doing this with that message. Elaine's nodding. Uh, she can probably remember dad taking care of something. Yeah, and, and it's not only parishioners, it's family members too sometimes. Um, but we, we, that's the thing that we sometimes forget. We can't, we, we only can forgive in measure that we understand God's forgiveness toward us. And um, to put it on a scale, my neighbor's sin against me seems so great and burdensome until I see my own sin against God. Then my neighbor's sin doesn't seem that great and burdensome anymore. But the devil, best ear shoulder sitter, he, he's going to endeavor to tell you that that person shouldn't be forgiven. Is not good he doesn't deserve forgiveness, etc., etc. Andy, it's like the, uh, the uh, knowledge of good and evil is the beginning of scorekeeping. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Of, our, of others, but of ourselves too. Yeah, and and th this became a perfected art at the time of Jesus in the Pharisee camp. You know, thank God I am not like other people murderers, adulterers, fornicators, and the like. I'm born special. <laughs> yeah. With blonde hair. Yeah. Oh, no, gray hair. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. Oh, well, you have hair, Jerome. Hey. Stick with that. It's, it's sweet. <laughs> For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. <clears throat> It doesn't look like that sometimes, does it? Have you ever thought about what, why you confess in the creed, I believe in the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting? Because we haven't seen it. We only have the promise. And we have promises that have been already fulfilled, I will send a Savior into the world, Jesus. We look back on that. That, the scriptures almost always call faith. 
But forgiveness of sins, resurrection of the body, and life everlasting, um, <coughs> if you've been to a legitimate funeral service, you hear that expressed, don't you, in the liturgy. The hope of the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Why hope? Because we can't see it fully yet. Yet. Doesn't mean it's not there. Just means we are incapable of seeing it fully. And that biblical term is hope. Whenever you see that word hope, that's almost always what the scriptures are talking about. Uh, promises not yet fully realized. Um, that's an Advent word, isn't it? Our hope and expectation of Jesus now appear. And when we pray for His coming, we're giving thanks to God for His first coming in the flesh. But also we are praying for His final coming in the flesh, even as we live, as He comes to us in the flesh, in word and sacrament. And so we live in faith and hope. And I would suggest those are synonyms. Uh, they, they are they're actually the same thing. It's all about the promises of God. Some that have been delivered and fulfilled, some that we still await. And because Christ was raised, what does Jesus tell us, or the, the scriptures tell us? In hope, we know that we too will be raised. And that is the hope in which Paul says, 1 Corinthians 15, in which we live. Because Christ was raised, you too will be raised. Okay. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. Faith. Um, is that, can we say your faith? Well, we can, but we ought not. Faith is always that connecting point that reconnects us to God. And when we talk about our faith, it's as though it's a knowledge or an ascent or, or you know, all those kind of words we want to throw out sometimes, particularly if we're of the Baptist persuasion. You know, we want to talk about what we bring to the table. And um, uh, that, that's a Martha approach to having Jesus in our house, not a Mary approach. Okay. Could you expand on uh, overcoming the world? Does that mean uh, temporal or does that mean eternal uh, overcoming of this of this life? And, and how am I going to answer that, Norm, with one word? I'm going to say yes. <coughs> of course. Except for this. We don't always see it in this life, do we? As a matter of fact, the church is hidden in this life. We don't see it at all in this life. And that's a problem for us. Dennis? Can you explain overcome? Yeah. Um, I think I want to say it this way. That we do not let the troubles, cares, and worries of the world be, be owned by us. Um, yeah, I struggled with that when I was preparing this, this text. This, this overcome the world. Man, it doesn't look that way at all. No. It looks just the opposite. But as, as Andy said earlier, but God is in charge. God's running it. Boy, it seems a strange way to run things to me sometimes. <laughs> yeah. But It's not the way I'd run it. Yeah. Thanks be to God. But because of communications, we know more about the world than we've ever known in the past. And we're bombarded with the world and the way things are in the secular world. And now, you just added something in that, the secular world. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm right. We, we are bombarded with that. But so that's the, not the only world. I think the question becomes is how much of that 
garbage or how much of the knowledge of the world and what's going on uh, should we pack into our brains or should we just overcome it by turning off the television and turning I mean just getting just getting the, the you know the, the big messed up world uh, little bits and pieces instead of watching Fox News 24/7 uh, okay when when the world was quote simpler that is without television and the internet in Luther's day what was the preferred means of dealing with the world in religious circles? Have a beer? No. That was the Lutheran way eventually. <laughs> it didn't start out that way. What was the way? Letters. Separate yourself from the world. Go to a monastery, go to a cloister, go to a nunnery, and then you won't have these problems. Want to bet? Yeah. Now we just moved to Tennessee, okay? Yeah. Especially if you're an elder. I keep telling Rick, be careful who you appoint as elders here. We, we can't afford to lose any more to Tennessee. Um, you know, seriously, uh, though, I think when we look, faith focuses on Christ, and our old nature focuses on <coughs> The world and we overcome our old nature focusing on Christ and that's faith mm -hmm. faith has Christ what we want to do is include in faith looking over our shoulder now when I was a, a young man Minnesota did not have a a law about water skiing that you had to have two people in the boat. They do now. And I can remember when they passed that law. There was a horrific, not two uh, boat accident, but three or four, where they were all looking over their shoulder and they all came to the same point at the same time. <coughs> and um, when you think about that, if, if Christ is here and faith is focused on Christ and I want to turn around and look at how well I'm doing in the world, <coughs> what have I done? Yeah, I've taken my <coughs> eye off the prize. And the prize comes over here. So my answer to this question is faith looks here the world is tugging at our coattails and, and biting us in the backside, and and that's where we want to look. But John is telling us no, 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 no. Faith looks on Jesus. Rick, here's a comment um, for me. Uh, for me, understanding this is when we were, John actually brought this up earlier. John 16. This is Jesus then that says it. And, it's, and, and what he says is, you know, have peace. Why have peace? Because you're going to have tribulation. No. He promises us that. So as we're living our life, you need to remember the next word. Because I have overcome the world. It's, it's not a panacea. It is that future state that we're looking for. We're going to struggle every single day. Jesus promised us that. We are going to have tribulation in this world, but I have overcome the world. Yeah. And, and, and where, where did he overcome the world? Right there. His death and resurrection. Yep. Yeah. And, and so that is where the Christian needs to put their eyes on. Mrs. Just Stroke. a comment on, and thank you, Mary. Oh, she's gone. And the choir. Thank you. Because the words in this song are so beautiful today. So if you didn't focus on them, make sure you read them again. And I want to read verse 3. Rely on God's protection with courage. Wait each day. God's truth <coughs> is your affection when weak, your hope, and stay. We, they're beautiful words. Thank you so much. Yeah, and, and they fit in with our text just, yeah. just hunky-dory, too. So thank you, Janet. Appreciate that. Okay. Um, I'm going to uh, pause a minute for today. <coughs> Move down. Put that in here if I can.
And we'll begin with verse 5 again um, next week. Um, so, um, for the next couple months, um, Pastor Meyer and I will be flipping back and forth doing various things. Um, uh, he's going to be gone first part of August, and, and I'm going to be gone first part of September, and da 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 da. So, we're trying to keep this as clean for you as we can. Uh, Bible class may may fluctuate between what Pastor Meyer is doing and what I'll, I'll be doing. Um, but uh, hopefully that keeps you on your toes. Um, so we'll, we'll just go with that. Um, with that, we adjourn with the apostolic benediction, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Thank you.